Hi guys, good morning. Uh, how are you? I hope you are all healthy and fine. Okay, let's um, discuss the next topic of our class, discourse analysis. Today I'm going to talk about chapter four in Andrew Cotley's book. It's an interpreting discourse. Okay, let's go to my PowerPoint. Okay, so the title is Interpreting Discourse. So these are some points, some important points of the chapter. Uh, it says that meanings cannot be obtained from the text only. Uh, we infer the ideas or we understand the ideas better from the text by using our prior knowledge. Yeah, so um, later I'm going to explain to you the concept of schema. Schema is actually our prior knowledge about something which enables us to understand message uh, more clearly and better. And then you have a, uh, what is called presupposition. Later I'm going to explain what presupposition is, but actually it is a powerful means for smuggling ideas in a certain ideology. Um, and then you have the concept of propositional attitude. It's actually simply stated it is what the speaker or the writer wants to say, what she or he intends to do yeah, by the language that he or she says or writes. So it tells us the real intention of a sender. Later, you can also learn that it, is, it can be expressed through irony and metaphor. I've put a, several, a separate file on metaphor on Microsoft Teams and you can have a go reading it yourself and grasp uh, the general idea of metaphor. And then we are also going to touch on advertisement, um, how advertisement relies on the power of inference. Okay, but this is are all the, some points that I'm going to explain later. So let's go to the decoding message. Uh, in decoding message, we have to do these steps. First of all, we have to recognize the propositions that are assumed, yeah, meaning the, the idea, the basic idea of the speaker or the writer. And then we have to decide the speaker's propositional attitude. As I said before, propositional attitude is actually what he or she wants to say, what he or she means. Yeah. Um, and then the third one is we have to infer what the speaker means or what he or she wants us to do. Um, simple example will be if you are in a classroom and the, uh, the air is hot, it's a bit warm, and then I say, uh, oh, it's very hot here and you can infer what I'm what I actually want. I want one of you to either to turn on the AC or to open the window. That's inferring. <clears throat> so in, if you look at the uh, textbook, you have the, the sentence, um, John and Mary. Uh, John has cooked a dinner and put a warm food on the table while Mary is busy reading and then John says, your food will get cold. Now let's analyze this sentence. John said, your food will get cold. First of all, we have to determine the proposition, the, the basic idea of this utterance. Um, it means that the food is hot. Yeah? Because if the food is not hot, then John will not say that. Then second one is uh, we have to determine John's propositional attitude. Yeah. John believes that the food is still hot. That's the propositional attitude. And then right after that, we have to infer. Yeah, we have to identify uh, what John actually wants, what John actually means. Yeah. We have to identify John's implied message by saying your food will get cold Actually, John wants Mary to eat the food at once. See, 
in this kind of decoding message. Decoding means understanding message. You have these three steps involved. Okay. Um, now presuppositions. I know that you are dying to know what on earth it is. Yeah. Presuppositions actually is, is an idea that remains valid or remains true, although the sentence is negated. By negated, I mean it's turned into negative sentence. So although the sentence is negated, although the sentence is turned into negative, the idea remains valid, remains true. Okay, let's see the example. For example, uh, I say, I park my car at the basement. Yeah, I park my car at the basement. This presupposes an idea. That is, I have a car. Right? Why? Because although the sentence is negated into, I don't park my car at the basement, the idea of I have a car is still valid, is still true. Right? So this is what we call presuppositions. An idea which remains true, which remains valid, although the sentence or the utterance is turned into negative. If you say, um, my laptop works well, yeah, then it presupposes the idea of you have a laptop, right? Because if I say, if you say, my laptop doesn't work well, the idea of you have a laptop is still valid, is still true. So that's why it is a presupposition, right? Okay, I hope you have the idea now. Uh, there are some types of presuppositions. If you read along with the pages on the book, in the book, you will see that we have existential presupposition, which is by mentioning a noun, we presuppose that it exists. So, for example, if somebody writes "shopaholic is a disease," yeah. he presupposes that there is such thing as shopaholic. By saying shopaholic or by writing shopaholic, we are forced to believe that there is a thing that is a phenomenon called shopaholic, right? It is existential presupposition. Another example will be, look at the word God. If we say God exists or God controls the world or God created the world, yeah. The word God is also existential presupposition. The moment we say God, we actually force the readers to believe that there is an entity called God. Yeah. That's why presupposition is a very powerful means of smuggling the idea, yeah. of shaping or forcing our mind to believe that something exists. Okay? The next one is a possessive presupposition uh, by the use of pronominal adjective or possessive as we presuppose a possession. For example, I looked under John's piano for your cat. Yeah, this sentence presupposes that you have a cat and also presupposes John has a piano. Yeah, look at the sentence. If I put this, in, if I turn this into negative, I didn't look under John's piano for your cat. These two are still valid. These two are still true. Right? You still have a cat and John has a piano. Although I put not here, I did not look under John's piano for your cat. This true, uh, sorry, this two remains true or valid. And that is presupposition. Okay. Again, other types of presuppositions is what we call chains of state presupposition. You can see uh, textbook on page 125. For example, this lipstick will make you beautiful. It presupposes an idea, a better idea that you are not beautiful. The next one, the software improves your grammar. This also presupposes the idea that your grammar is bad. 
Well, I hope that doesn't apply to you, right? Since you have passed grammar one and grammar two with me. And uh, the next one, she enables you to feel happy. That presupposes the idea that you don't feel happy. So this is the chains of state presupposition. And as you can see later, this will be very powerful when it comes to writing advertisements. If you are learning copywriting, then this knowledge might be might come in handy for you. Um, okay, testing presupposition. It's only a way of ensuring that uh, if you have a sentence with a sub clause and main clause, yeah, for example, when John came in, the dog was alive. You know that when John came in, it's a sub clause, a subordinate clause, yeah, and the, the dog was alive is the main clause. This is the subordinate clause, anak kalimat, and this the indo kalimat, the dog was alive. So if we test the main clause, the dog was alive or the dog was not alive. If we put, uh, if we change the dog was alive into negative, the dog was not alive. In either way, John came in still holds true. Yeah, so this one, yeah, when John came in, is the presupposed idea, is the presupposition. Okay. Of course, you can have your other um, subclause and main clause, and then you'll see it for yourself that the subclause is actually is always presupposed. That is always uh, the presupposition. Um, okay, we are going to um, discuss this later. I'm going to put this on the Microsoft Teams as a something for you to think and to work on. Yeah, if you've been following the my lecture very closely, you'll be able to to answer this. But okay, later we are going to discuss the answers to that. Um, the next topic that I would like to discuss is what we call irony. When expressing an irony, the speaker actually doesn't believe that something he said is true. Yeah, and at the same time, she also expects the reader or the listener to believe that it is not true either. Yeah? Such a bizarre phenomenon of human beings. <laughs> they say something and they don't believe that it is true and they uh, also expect the, re the listeners or the readers to believe that it is not true. That's called irony. Irony is used to express disappointment or to exaggerate things. And that comes when we comes in a, you, you often use that when you uh, write your creative writing or produce a novel or a poem or something like that. Yeah. Okay, let's see the example of an irony. A group of people are waiting for someone who is supposed to come on time. And uh, turns out that he shows up 40 min minutes late. The leader of the group, who is uh, very much annoyed, says to him, Oh, thank you for coming on time. You have been so kind as to keep, our, keep us waiting. Yeah. See, actually the leader doesn't um, mean this. Actually the leader, of course the leader believes that it is not true. Right? And he expects the listener, especially the latecomer, to believe that it is not true either. Why does he say that? That just because he was annoyed, he is upset, he is disappointed by the late uh, coming of the of the person. Okay, that's irony. Or take this example: a father uh, to his son who scores poorly in his test. Good son, you earned 25, 30, and 46. Keep up the good work. See, this is irony also. The father doesn't believe that it is a good work. Yeah? And but at the same time, the father also expects his son not to believe that it is true. It is sad because he is angry. He is upset with the son's uh, poor work uh, in school. Okay, that's irony. Um, next one. Uh, I'm going to put this as the last point before we go on to the next to the assignments. Yeah. It's uh, called schema. Schema is actually a structured framework in our minds 
about things in the world. So if you look deep into your mind, you'll see that it consists of framework, framework about everything, about school, about family, about cars, about traffic, about uh, gadgets, about uh, behavior, yeah, many kinds of things, about cafe that you uh, often go to, to hang around with your buddies, yeah. um, about lectures, yeah. everything is stored in our minds as a structured framework. So it's not loose, it's, it doesn't, um, it's not, uh, it doesn't consist of loose points, but it, it is in the form of a very tight structure. It is called a schema. So for example, if you think about university, then actually in your mind, uh, you will think about the students, uh, lecturers, credits or SKS, yeah, curriculum, extracurricular activities, etc. Yeah, and also how they are related to each other. You know that students um, go to class and lecturers come and teach the students. And by the end of the semester, they get some credits yeah, and everything is set in the curriculum. And besides the courses, uh, the students also attend extracurricular activities. Yeah. Imagine it becomes a point cut defined. Those kinds of things, all the things and the connection between them is called schema. Yeah, schema is actually uh, the structure. The structure con contains several concepts or several points and how they are related to each other. See, if I say restaurant or cafe, then in your mind, you have a schema. You have a structured framework of how a restaurant works. Yeah. How you are, how you will have to order food. How will you pay? Yeah. So those kinds of things. So we use a schema when we are interpreting a message. Yeah. Um, every time you read something, you will activate your schema, although probably you are not conscious of the process, but you actually activate your schema in your mind so that you will be able to understand the message better. If you activate the wrong schema, then you interpret the message wrongly because you happen to use the wrong schema. Yeah, for example, if, I, if you ask me, okay, uh, sir, why don't we go to the uh, cafe library? And then I say, okay, when I, when I hear the word library, my schema is a place full of books which I, uh, where I can read and uh, have a quiet time to read yeah, alone. But then it turns out that we get there, it's actually a cafe, not a library. And so I have interpreted the me your message wrongly because I activate the wrong schema. Yeah, nowadays, library can also mean a cafe, right? Where people go to have uh, meals and nice food, not necessarily place uh, which keeps books to be read, right? Okay, so that's an uh, interpretation uh, which relies on schema. Okay, guys, I think uh, these are all the points that I'm going to explain. Uh, you'll have to listen to this lecture and then um, do the assignments that I put on the Microsoft Teams. Uh, all of them are related to the things that I have discussed here. Okay, guys, that's all um, my topic. Um, have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And goodbye.